Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Micah. Um, I'm the web developer for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And this is Ellie. I'm Ellie Jones. I'm the director of nonprofit projects at Chapter 3. So, who is the EFF, you ask? Does everybody know who the EFF is? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, well, great. Uh, in case there's somebody who doesn't, we are a nonprofit law firm that protects uh, digital civil liberties. And we do things like make it so you could legally jailbreak your iPhone and so that you don't have a censored internet. And uh, we write some tools to make it so you, your use of the internet is more secure and things like that. Um, so. So uh, this is kind of a story about like the history of the EFF website a little bit. Um, back in 2006, uh, I was the webmaster at the EFF and I moved the EFF website into Drupal 5 and we were kind of like early Drupal adopters. It was like a giant project. There were thousands of legal PDFs, tons of flat files laying around a directory structure. Um, and we did that, it was great, and then I left to go do freelancey things and left EFF to its own devices with its Drupal 5 site. And you know, we do this a lot in agencies, we build sites and then we go away. So I built a site and then I went away to do more Drupal stuff. And then I came back a few years later because I'm still friends with people at EFF and they were like, look, we need to upgrade to Drupal 7, things are a mess. So you get in there and it's just like, I had to face my own mess that I had made, basically. I had to eat my own dog food and look at this site that I had built when it was my very first Drupal site ever. So, yeah, so they were, they were still in Drupal 5 and that's a common situation, actually. It's kind of like the dirty secret of the Drupal world, especially in the nonprofit world. There's a lot of sites out there that are still on Drupal 5. Is anybody here still on Drupal 5? Know anybody that's on Drupal 5? Yeah. Drupal 5 is no longer supported. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, when I started working at EFF about a year ago, we were using Convio as our CRM, and uh, we used it for a variety of things. Um, uh, basically, for those that don't know, Convio is a CRM, which is a constituent relation manager, something like that, um, but it contains the whole database of our contacts, and we use it to uh, accept donations and to send bulk emails and to do action alerts, which is something that we do a lot at EFF. Um, but it had problems. Uh, it was really expensive. Um, Convio costs more than my salary, so uh, like every year. And it's proprietary and we like to use uh, free software when we can. And um, you know, as like an organization that is really into privacy and really into protecting people's data. Um, we don't like the idea that our whole like membership database is stored on a third party that can get subpoenaed um, and things like that. And they have some security problems. Like we discovered that if you are a uh, EFF member and you wanna log in and change your um, contact information or something or unsubscribe from a list or something and you don't know what your password is, you can use their password reset function, and uh, it just emails you your password, and in plain text, and which means that they're not storing the passwords encrypted. And so we talked to them about it, and they insisted that they were encrypting passwords, even though that's not possible. <laughs> um, they also had some like weird limitations where they don't let you use a lot of special characters in your passwords, and it can't be more than eight characters. I don't know why. Um, and then also Convio, uh, for like action alerts, especially and for donate pages and stuff, it's very hard to make it look exactly how you want to make it look um, and make it work exactly how you want to make it work because you basically are able to define templates but not too much more. And Civi CRM is kind of difficult too, but it's definitely, it's possible because we're hosting it ourselves and we have programmers, basically. Um, and our Convio co contract was close to running out and so I actually got hired specifically to move us over uh, to Civi CRM from uh, Convio. So the solution to both of these problems that were on old Drupal 5 and that we wanted to leave Convio and start using Civi CRM uh, uh, 
uh, was to upgrade to Drupal 7 and start using Civi CRM. And uh, they needed each other because Civi CRM, the latest version, didn't work on Drupal 5. And uh, so we, when we did, did this, we decided to do the upgrades all at the same time. And that was in October. Um, and then uh, we launched our uh, Drupal site. And then like a week or two later, we launched Civi CRM. And Civi CRM is actually on a different uh, subdomain from our website because it has different needs, kind of. Like our main website doesn't have, like it's basically a lot of static content. There's no like comments or anything and no one's submitting forms. And so the entire thing could be uh, cached behind a, a caching proxy like Varnish. Um, where Civi CRM, like the donate pages needs to use sessions and it needs to do all this stuff and it just made sense to split them into separate sites. And we're actually sharing the same code base and using a Drupal multi-site um, with different modules enabled in each. Um, and so what is Civi CRM? It's a uh, open source CRM uh, software and technically it's a giant, giant Drupal module. And it's also a giant, giant Joomla module and a giant, giant WordPress plugin. Um, so the idea is it just works with whatever your CMS is. And uh, uh, yeah, so it does all of the stuff that Convio is doing or the other C CRMs like Salsa, which we're gonna talk about more, uh, do, except you host it yourself in your Drupal site. Um. So let's talk a little bit about what happens if you're still on Drupal 5. Um, a lot of times when you uh, start talking about getting off of Drupal 5 and upgrading, people will say, oh, well, you should upgrade from Drupal 5 to Drupal 6 and then from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7. Um, I don't think that that, I think if your site is quite small and very simple, then that will work. But for the most part, um, pretty much if you've been on Drupal 5 for this long, you've probably built some things in crazy ways that are different than how you would want to do it on Drupal 7. So you're pretty much looking at building a Drupal 7 site in the best possible, best practices, awesomest way, and then migrating your data from your happy Drupal 5 database using a migration process. So it's a little bit of a bummer at first. You're like, oh, I can't use the upgrade path. But in general, I think it's good because it causes you to have to step back and reevaluate kind of what your best practices are and what you want to do in the future. And if you're using Drupal 5, you probably made that website a long time ago, <laughs> and things have changed yeah. since then. Okay. So the approach that we took with the EFF was uh, we tried to just keep what we were doing really minimal. It's tempting when you're, once you get past the thing where you're like, okay, now we're gonna rebuild a site, we're gonna make a new site in Drupal 7 and migrate stuff into it. It's tempting to be like, okay, let's also do a redesign, and let's like reorganize all of our information architecture and et cetera. Like, that's a giant thing to undertake. And I think you know, it's kind of a, a better approach to do the bare minimum to get your current information architecture, clean it up a bit if you need to, get it into Drupal 7, and then you have your foundation for the redesign, the beautiful, wonderful phase two redesign you're gonna do later on. So this is just an example of kind of just show you just the, the minimal changes. We had to make a new theme, so it would have been like criminal not to spiff, spiff things up a bit, but we didn't, so this is how it used to look, and this is what we did to it. So we kept the same basic feel, like the sidebar is the same, the callouts are the same, uh, not too shocking, just trying to get the data in there. Except that sign up for our mailing list thing it goes to Civi CRM instead of Convia now. <laughs> So along the way, we learned some things, which is good to do. Um, we wrote a bunch of custom migration scripts. They were nice migration scripts to get things from Drupal 5 to Drupal 7, and they were like Drush integrated and everything. But uh, about three weeks after we finished the EFF migration, we discovered that there's this awesome module called Migrate module, which gives you these great tools for doing data migrations into Drupal. So use that. <laughs> Um, and probably one of the biggest mistakes we made was sort of more of like a human communication mistake, which is um, the EFF site was really old and because it, it had been through so many migrations and there's just tons of content on it and we were kind of cavalier about it. We just sort of moved everything old into the new site and there was a lot of stakeholders at the EFF, like everyone's very involved in the website and I think that's the case with a lot of nonprofits that 
people are all very involved. Like you're not gonna get like a department that is just doing the web communication and no one else cares. Like everyone's kind of in there. So we definitely ended up with a situation where like we moved everything over and there was this nice new redesign and people were looking anew at content that they hadn't seen in a few years or hadn't really noticed. And there were definitely some problems. There was like things that hadn't been there, like hadn't been moved in from the first migration. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot of content missing that people were complaining about but uh, never made it to Drupal 5. <laughs> at all. And yeah. So, so actually we got like a flood of like problems that we had to fix and so we had to um, set up a bug tracker to handle it all. Uh, like internally <laughs> for our website. Yeah, so the lesson there is to do better content strategy before you start and get more people involved with like checking the content that you're moving over and testing the site before you push it live. So, um, so VCRM can do a lot of things, but it didn't do everything that we were using Convio for. Um, you can send bulk mailings through CiviCRM, but you need to have an email server. Um, and so Civi SMTP is a service that basically uh, they let people who use Civi CRM just use their SMTP server to send massive amounts of emails. And we've been working closely with them to uh, get our bulk mails uh, to go a bit quicker because our mailing list has been growing and growing in size. But it's way nicer to do that than try and just use your web server as an email server because then you have to deal with all of this drama that happens when you try and send bulk emails. Um, and then CiviCRM doesn't have an advocacy campaign section. Um, and so we're actually using Salsa for the action alerts. And we have it integrated into CiviCRM and I'll explain how that works uh, more. But um, the reason why CiviCRM doesn't have this and the reason why it's kind of a hard problem to solve is basically an action alert is a form that people come to and fill out and it contacts their representative. It has to look up their representative based on their zip code and it sends an email and a, or a fax to their representative. But uh, different members of Congress do things in different ways. I think they all have publicly available fax numbers but only some of them have email addresses and a lot of them don't have email addresses and only have forms on their website and some of these forms have different fields that are required and sometimes, and so like what Salsa has done is they basically wrote scripts that uh, set, that submit these forms on people's websites automatically. But as soon as like some senator redesigns their website, their script might break, and then they have to fix it. And it's and you know the people who are elected change every couple years, and so it it's like a full time job just to keep this whole infrastructure working. And uh, it's something that you need that you can't really have like an open source project that just, here's an action alerts thing, you need to actually have like an API that does the sending. Um, and then the other things are, uh, we accept donations uh, through Civi CRM and so we need a payment processors and we're using authorize.net and PayPal for that. And those are fully supported in Civi CRM. So, uh, the migration from Convio into Civi CRM was an API party, it was wild. Um, <laughs> There was, there was lots of good laughs, but really it was a nightmare <laughs> because uh, the Convio API really doesn't work for trying to get massive amounts of data out of Convio. Um, like you can't actually get more than 500 rows in any sort of request to the Convio API and there's, they only let you have access to very specific pieces of information. So we used it a little bit, but we mostly didn't use it. Um, and what we found is that the Salesforce API does let you get access to everything and Convio has this service called Common Ground where they sync your Convio database with your Salesforce database. And so we started using that and had our Convio data synced into Salesforce and then we used the Salesforce API to migrate it into Civi CRM through the Civi CRM API. And um, we didn't really use the Salsa API for this but we use it every single hour now. I'll talk more about that later. Um, but in order to do this, we had about 200,000 contacts to move into Civi CRM. And we had to basically just write this crazy huge sprawling script and test it in a bunch of different ways and run it in different segments. Like you have to have contacts imported before you can import the donations and all sorts of stuff. 
Um, and we did all this, and it took several months, but we finally managed to get all of the data into Civi CRM. Um, well, that's what we thought, and then it turned out, like a month later, that we realized that random like contacts that we knew were there were missing, and random donations were missing, and we tracked it down to common ground not actually working. There was a lot of uh, data that was still in Convio that never made it to Salesforce, and so we had to like go and run reports in Convio and write other scripts to import it. And it was pretty, it was totally a nightmare, and it was an API party also at the same time. <laughs> um, and, but uh, it was worth it because now we're using Civi CRM, and since we launched in October, when we started with around 200,000 contacts, we have over a million contacts now, and we have, we're hosting it ourselves, and so, um, and we have, you know, we're lucky enough to have uh, web developers on staff at EFF, and so we, uh, are able to just do whatever we want with it. Like, if the uh, fundraising team needs some special thing for some special fundraising campaign that looks all crazy and has counters and stuff, we could like spend a couple days and build it for them. Um, and so that's pretty cool. Oh, and so then uh, recurring credit card donations. This was a really tough problem because we had about a thousand recurring donors in Convio, and when we close our Convio account, then suddenly their credit cards will stop getting charged and we thought we were gonna have to like contact these thousand people and ask them to re-sign up in Civi CRM, which means a lot of them wouldn't sign up. Um, but we were, we heard from a, uh, someone at Rainforest Action Network actually that they had the exact same issue when they switched from Convio to Salsa and they were able to save their recurring donations. So we spent a lot of work trying to save ours. And we eventually did by getting, um, figuring out who our payment processor was, which was pretty hard to figure out, and then getting them to send us the actual credit card numbers, and then recharging the credit card numbers through Civi CRM, but we only had credit card numbers and expiration dates, and like Convio user IDs, we didn't have anything else, and so we had to like figure out what Civi CRM contacts they were, and we had to like hack the payment processors in Civi CRM temporarily to disable checking the security code, because we didn't have security codes, and we had to write a Selenium script that every day charged <laughs> credit cards for that day. So the moral of this story is, if you want to save recurring donors because you're switching from one CRM to another CRM, if you have like a small number of recurring, if you have like less than 100, it's a lot less work to just call those 100 people and get them to do it. Um, yeah. So this is how our EFF Action Center works. Basically, the point of our Action Center is so that the people can stick it to the man. And um, we're using Salsa to host our action alerts, and uh, this green line is uh, uh, get requests, or HTTP requests. And so what happens is when people go to take action, they load our action alert on Salsa, and then they submit it to Salsa, and Salsa contacts Congress. And then on success, they get redirected to uh, supporters.eff.org to a thank you page, and the thank you page is actually a uh, Civi CRM donate page. It lets you like share uh, this stuff on Twitter and Facebook and also donate if you want. Um, and then the blue line is a, a, a cron job that we run once an hour that uses the Salsa API to figure out the latest people who have taken action and then import those people into Civi CRM and uh, record in their contacts record that uh, they took action. Um, and this has actually been working pretty well for us. And so that way we're still just using Civi CRM for everything and Salsa for the action alerts. But this is actually something that we want to make it look like instead, and the people, and right now it's not really possible, the, the people at Salsa said that we can do it. We wanna make it so that we host our own action alerts because we can do a lot of cool stuff with we could host our own action alerts and then use the Salsa API to just say, here's a contact, here's the message, send a message to Congress. And, um, uh, sometime when we have time and we're gonna work with Salsa and start doing it this way instead. Um, and then, you know, it's like salsa, hosting your action alerts with Salsa is similar to hosting them with Convio. You're able to change the template, but you can't change all that much. But if we host it ourselves, we'll be able to like add live counters of how many people have signed so far and like pull data from other places to put on that action alert page and other things like that. So, um, <laughs> The open source community is pretty awesome, and uh, one of the things that we really like about Civi CRM is that uh, it's open source, and we could uh, look at the source code, and you know, when bugs happen, we could actually just patch the bugs and submit patches, and everyone benefits. And we can extend it really easily. 
we could write Drupal modules that work with Civi CRM, which we've done a lot of to make Civi CRM work for us. Um, and uh, we also go to code sprints, and we hosted a code sprint like the week that we were launching Civi CRM. Actually, there was a code sprint, and it was really cool because there were all of these Civi CRM developers, and like we're like, oh crap, how do we do this thing? And then like some of the core developers are like, oh here's how. So that was cool. Um, and uh, we hosted a meetup recently, and now we actually have like some stuff that we need in Civi CRM, and so we're giving the Civi CRM project money to develop it for us, and everyone will benefit from that. Um, and we'll talk about those in the next slide. So part of the story is that um, EFF is really lucky in that it has some like hardcore nerds working there who are able to connect all of these pieces. Um, but one of the, the themes here is that you know EFF start, has started working with Civi CRM and just becoming part of that community. And if you are at a nonprofit and you don't have in-house development capacity, what do you do? There's a couple of things. Um, one thing is that you can hire a Civi CRM expert using that, those URLs that are down there. Um, you can find a contractor to help you build out your Civi CRM installation. And the other thing is that there's a lot of nonprofits getting together who collaborate to sort of pool their resources and pool their funding to get the features that they need for their websites built and all benefit from that at the same time. Um, a good example of that is the, the Watershed Now project, um, which you can Google and find out about. Um, Civi CRM has uh, Make It Happen campaigns, <coughs> which are pretty cool. It's, uh, there, if there are features that a lot of different organizations want in Civi CRM, um, they uh, estimate how much it'll cost to develop this feature and then organizations could donate money towards this feature. And so a good example of a Make It Happen campaign is we accept uh, donations through credit cards, through Authorize.net, and through PayPal. And we also want to accept it through Google Checkout. Um, but the way that it works now, every donate page can only work with one payment processor, which is really annoying. So that means we have, for every donate page we have, we have another one for PayPal. And then if we were gonna do Google, Google Checkout, we'd have to have three donate pages for every donate page. And uh, one of the Make It Happen campaigns is to have, uh, let people choose what payment processor they wanna use when they're donating on the same donate page. And so that's actually one of the things that we're helping fund. And then everyone will be able to start accepting lots of payment processes and it'll be great. <laughs> so mistakes were made part two. Uh, this, this one was actually my fault. Micah told me that they were needing to build their EFF shop, and I was like, oh, you should use Drupal Commerce. It's awesome, it's new, it's great. And it turned out that Drupal Commerce was just kind of like too much for what they needed. They really needed a small shop where people could kind of like buy a T-shirt or buy like what a, a First Amendment rights metal card that you can carry in your wallet to set off the metal detectors of the TSA, or Fourth Amendment rights, sorry. Um, so. Eventually, they just kind of ended up using Ubercart instead after struggling with Drupal Commerce a lot. And that's a good example of something where, like, it doesn't really, uh, tools that are great for business, which is like a giant shop with a giant pre API framework for building a store, uh, they really just needed something out of the box they could open up that was like, all right, now we have products in a shopping cart at the end. So, um, here's some security stuff that we do on our website. Um, so, our website is uh, separated out into www.eff.org and supporters.eff.org for Civi CRM. And the whole www part of our website is just a whole lot of static content. There's like blog posts, FOIA requests, documents you could download, and like lots of other information. And um, as a privacy organization, uh, we decided it makes sense to not set cookies in people's browsers when they visit our website. And so we did some stuff to totally disable uh, cookies getting set. Um, and uh, we did this in some varnish settings and also we changed our settings.php file for uh, www.eff.org. Um, and this also has other benefits. It means that if you can't have cookies set at that domain name, then you can't log in at that domain name. Which means that even if we have like gaping security holes in some module and someone figures out how to hack it to get like administrative rights, they can't do it because they can't get administrative rights if they don't have a session. And so they, there's just no way of logging in. So it's pretty cool, but then that means how do we log into our site? 
we have a different uh, domain name that we use to log into our site, and that different domain name is all protected with uh, HTTP basic authentication. So when you go to the domain name where cookies are allowed to get set, um, it pops up a thing where you have to type in a username and password. Um, so people actually have to type in two usernames and passwords to get in. But uh, it definitely makes things really nice and secure. And I actually hear that uh, whitehouse.gov that uses Drupal does a very similar type of thing. Cookies don't get set on whitehouse.gov and instead uh, they have to be using a specific whitehouse VPN to log in. They have to come from like the right IP address or else you can't log in, which just has like very huge security benefits um, for a lot of things. Uh, and then we, uh, oh yeah, um, <laughs> so we are a big uh, proponent of deprecating HTTP and making it so that everything goes over HTTPS. And uh, so our whole, like everything at www.eff.org or supporters.eff.org goes is just through HTTPS. If you go to HTTP, you get redirected. Um, and, but our website has been getting more and more traffic the more, uh, uh, we, the more popular we get and the more we grow. And Drupal has had hard times handling all of this traffic. And so we decided we needed to have a caching proxy. And so we're using Varnish. But Varnish can't handle HTTP. So we're also using Pound, which is um, a server that, that like handles, that initiates HTTPS connections and then forwards that stuff onto Varnish. And then Varnish either serves cached copies or forwards that stuff onto Apache. And so it's this big convoluted thing, but it, it works. Um, and it's pretty cool because we're able to actually like, I don't know, there's lots of scaling stuff that could happen. Like if we wanted to, we could make it so that Pound is just running on one server and then, uh, and Varnish is running on that server and then Apache is running on lots of different servers and it could all work out. Um, and uh, then also we don't like it when people store more information about uh, visitors or about anyone than they need to store because all that information sitting around is, uh, uh, like it could contain lots of private information and it also could be an easy target for subpoenas. And so we don't log IP addresses. And for the longest time we were just not logging IP addresses, um, but now we are crypto logging IP addresses, which is, uh, uh, Cryptolog is the software that I wrote that is, it's, it's not done yet, it hasn't officially been launched, but if you actually want to look at it, um, there's the code, is at a git.eff.org, but it's basically, uh, instead of logging IP addresses in your logs, it, it logs a hash, and it's a hash of your IP address that's salted with some random data, and the salt changes once a day, so what this means in practice is that we don't log IP addresses, and if someone's looking at our logs, they can't figure out people's IP addresses from it, but we still get to know the difference between unique bits, uh, unique hits and page views. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, I am gonna go off on a tangent about SOPA PIPA Blackout Day um, and how this works with CiviCRM, but first, uh, are there any questions that you have about any of this stuff so far? Do you want to walk up to the mic? How are you dealing with PCI DSS uh, with authorized.net and Civi? Um, so we are we're starting to deal with it. We're not <laughs> we don't have PCI compliance yet, but we are in the process of going through all of the things to get PCI compliance which is kind of annoying. I actually thought that we didn't have to use, uh, we didn't have to be PCI compliant if we were using uh, authorized.net, but we do. And so um, we've been implementing lots of stuff and we're looking into vendors to do security scans on our site and stuff. We have like all sorts of security policy that we already have implemented, but we need to like make it fit within PCI's requirements. So, so that means you're using authorized.net's aim profile in Civi, right? Um, yes, I believe so. Where it's all embedded. It's not jumping out to authorize. Yeah, when yeah. so when people submit credit card numbers onto our website, it, they're making a post request with the credit card numbers to our website, and then we're using authorized.net's API to charge the card. Okay. We, we had to build a SIM custom module for that we're using ourselves. We haven't submitted it back yet, 
but I was just wondering how you were. How oh, you interesting. Were, uh, does yeah. does that avoid PCI compliance? Yeah, because wh what we actually do is we we built the sim module, and then what it does is when you get to the payment screen, you jump to authorize.net, and then we post back after the fact. But that's the only way we were able to get around PCI DSS with the University of. Interesting. Colorado. Do you want to show me that later? <laughs> That no. would be useful. No, I don't. <laughs> no. Yeah, yes, I'd love to. Yeah, okay. We can talk, yeah. Um, as someone who's built uh, many difficult websites that integrated Drupal 7 and CityCRM, I'm just extremely curious. Um, how much did you leverage entities and views, Drupal constructs, but then side CVCRM? We built the site using panels for everything. So it's mostly uh, the, well, for, for the EFF.org part of the site, it's all panels, panels everywhere, and views, content panes, and occasionally custom content type panes using the CTools API. And then uh, I think Micah built the uh, other supporters at EFF.org also uses panels everywhere in the same theme, and some views, and. Yeah, uh, so, well, so in terms of actually like, integrating CiviCRM with the rest of the site. We don't do that much of that. Like the public facing CiviCRM stuff is like donate pages and the form to subscribe to our mailing list and like, you know, our salsa action alerts. Um, and we and we like did some custom stuff. Like we made a, a, a Drupal form where you can submit your email address and it looks up your contact in CiviCRM and then sends you an email with a link to change your data because CiviCRM doesn't have any way of like letting people change their data out of the box. Um, but in terms of actually displaying information from Civi CRM to people, we don't really do that. We uh, pretty much just EFF staff does the displaying of information. So we haven't needed to do much of that stuff. Um, out of curiosity, when you were talking about uh, Drupal Commerce and not, not really using that, um, kind of similar to his question, uh, how, do you, how do you decide when to use you know, Drupal commerce, like if you're selling products and then, and you obviously want to display them on your public page and not your Civi CRM page. So do you have to have two separate um, purchasing options? Like you have a donation which is Civi CRM and then your products is still commerce? I think you'd have to just pick one or the other. Well, so Civi CRM doesn't have a, a store. It doesn't have a way of buying stuff. It has a way of donating and getting premiums. Like t you, you get a t-shirt if you donate enough money, but it doesn't actually have an online store. And um, so that's why we decided to use like Drupal Commerce and Ubercart uh, so that we could have like a store with a shopping cart and you can decide to get your Fourth Amendment uh, tape so that when you, you know, it's packaging tape, when people cut through your packaging tape to search your boxes, they're cutting through the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> um, but uh, if you like, so what we, we haven't actually done this yet, but we want to, it's still like a ticket to do, is uh, integrate the store with Civi CRM. Right now it's not integrated, but we want to make it so that when people buy stuff through Ubercart, it just adds a, a, like a record in their Civi CRM contact saying that they bought it. Would that be the same with like event registrations as well? Like uh, well, that. event registrations, uh, we c you could do that directly through Civi CRM. And we haven't done, we're like a, a we're just starting to test the Civi CRM event stuff. Like we're gonna have um, some events coming up, I think around DEF CON, and we're gonna have, use Civi CRM's event registration and have people uh, register through supporters.eff.org. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how all that stuff works, so I haven't looked a whole lot at it yet, but um, that's just a Civi CRM feature. Uh, you want to hear about the Blackout Day? It was pretty fun. Um, so Blackout Day was uh, January 18th, and um, you probably remember it because uh, the inter went, internet went dark and big websites like Wikipedia and Google participated in it. And uh, we at EFF have been doing a lot of work against internet censorship for a long time. And we've been doing work against uh, SOPA and PIPA since the bills were introduced, and COICA, which was the bill before it that was a censorship bill that didn't make it. Um, and so uh, we got a lot of traffic around that time. And uh, so Blackout Day was on a Wednesday. And the Friday before that, 
like around five o'clock, we heard from Wikipedia that they wanted to link to our petition. And, but they warned us that we need to be able to handle millions and millions and millions of hits in the course of a couple minutes, which we can't handle. And so um, uh, we, decide, we basically just like spent from that Friday evening to the next Tuesday um, building something that could handle that. And Wikipedia ended up not linking to us because I don't, I, I don't think they have faith that we could do it in time, but we did. But we got lots of other traffic. Um, but basically we built uh, a big infinitely scalable system on the Amazon cloud with a load balancer and lots of, uh, lots of servers sitting behind it and each server, like, I don't know. So we needed to be able to handle submissions of um, petitions and we also needed to be able to handle uh, donations because our CVC, like we load balanced our CVCRM donate form and sent a thousand requests at it like immediately one after another and it crashed Apache. Um, which isn't good because we were going to get much more than a thousand hits immediately. And so uh, uh, we actually programmed a, um, basically a, a HTML form that when you submit it, it just stores a row in a MySQL database. And, and that's, that was the petition. And then we made another basically an HTML form that's a credit card uh, form for a donate form. And when you submit it, it, uh, it charges the credit card using the authorized.net API and then stores a row in a database uh, that says like the person with this email address donated this much. And uh, we made it like very, very, very like streamlined. We like had to do things like make it so we don't, don't connect to MySQL until after people click submit because otherwise you have like millions of MySQL connections that are open not doing anything. Um, and uh, in order to do the credit card processing stuff, we actually just like looked at the CiviCRM authorized.net source code and ripped a bunch of stuff out and like remade it like a little bit simpler uh, and used it. And that was pretty cool because uh, it's another way that being open source really helped us in this case. Um, but anyways, uh, it was like 9 p.m. the day before blackout day and that was on the west coast which was midnight on the east coast when all of these websites were starting to black out and uh, uh, so our plan was to host our petition with Salsa, and as soon as Salsa, like if Salsa couldn't handle it, then we would fall back to hosting our petition ourselves with this big thing that we built. And it took about an hour before Salsa stopped being able to handle it, and their server just crashed, and it just stopped working. And I, that was around the same time that Minecraft.net started redirecting their whole website to us, and I think that that's probably why, I guess there's a lot of Minecraft users out there. Um, so we fell back to our thing, and our petition uh, didn't look super pretty, and Mozilla was gonna start their blackout at like 8 a.m., and, and when Mozilla was blacking out, it was like, if people installed Firefox and didn't change their default homepage, when they open Firefox, they'll see like a link to our petition, and then also when people are trying to download Firefox or Thunderbird or anything on mozilla.org, it would like just be replaced with the blackout with the link to our petition. and. Um, they were considering linking to the American censorship.org petition instead because it looks a lot better, but then they're like, but if you guys make your petition look a lot better before we launch at 8 a.m., which was 5 a.m. our time, um, then we'll link to you instead. So at like from midnight to like three, I designed this thing, which looks way nicer. And we also uh, looked at uh, the like how many people were submitting before this versus how many people were submitting after this. I don't have a screenshot of what it looked like before, but it was much uglier. But um, uh, like over twice as many people submit the nice form um, compared to like how many people load it, which was pretty cool. Um, and that's is actually one of the reasons why we want to host our action alerts ourselves because we can't actually make them look like like this. With fa this has fancy AJAX stuff and uh, or fancy jQuery stuff, um, and we can't really do all of that stuff hosted on Salsa, um, but we will be able to do this stuff if we host it all ourselves. Um, but yeah, uh, in the end, we sent over a million emails to Congress, and uh, we won, so it was cool. <laughs> so if you know someone who's still on Drupal 5, or you're still on Drupal 5, or you're stuck on something that's really difficult to work with, like Convio or Kintera, some people are on. Um, the message here is you can totally do it. It's hard, you're gonna have to write some data migration scripts, but you can do it, you can get your stuff into where it needs to be. 
Um, it's gonna be an API party, but it's gonna be fun because open source is here to help you. And yeah. Yay. Um, and also EFF is hiring a web developer right now. Uh, so look at our website and apply if you want to work for EFF. It's a pretty awesome place to work. Are there any other questions also? The question was, would you, would you plan more? Um, we did actually, uh, we were lucky in that the architecture on the Drupal 5 site pretty much informed the architecture on the Drupal 7 site. So we planned in that we looked at what was on the Drupal 5 site and what content we needed to move over. And the only thing we really changed was that there was a giant taxonomy of issues that are sort of like topics EFF covers. And the, in the former site, issues had been nodes, and in Drupal 7, issues became taxonomy terms. They were doing a lot of node reference stuff before, and then we sort of switched it over. So our, our plan was pretty much just like using the schema that we already had and then kind of adjusting it slightly. Um, I, I think, and we did write a development plan for part of it too. So, I mean, you can always plan more, but I, I think we did pretty good. What strategy are you deploying that deals with Drupal accounts versus just like a regular individual Civi account? Are all of your Civi accounts also Drupal accounts, or do you have some variation in there? So we have it so that um, <coughs> Civi CRM doesn't create Drupal users. So you have that set. Yeah, yeah, you, so yeah. You could you could do that. You can make it so when people uh, when contacts are created in Civi CRM, it creates a Drupal user for them and links the accounts and stuff. But we don't want anyone logging into our site basically besides us, and so we just don't make users for them. And instead of, um, instead of that, we made it so that people could still like update the information in their contact record by doing this form that we made. So it, is that one of the reasons you're separating on different domains? Here's an example I would say. Let's say you had uh, a blog running or comments running on EFF.org and people feel that they've already gone in, they've donated, they've created an account, but they can't use that account to come. They would have two accounts at your site. That's, that's currently your strategy, if that's well, the case? Well, we actually don't have comments on EFF.org, which makes it so we don't have that problem. Um, uh, like, EFF.org is all static for the people outside that look at it. So, um, so we just avoid the issue by having nobody log into our website, to Civi CRM or to Drupal, uh, like at all, except for EFF staff. And it's actually like, it turns out to be really nice, like how Convio used to store plain text passwords. Well, we don't have passwords for our members anymore, which um, it's, it's a lot nicer to not have to have a giant database of passwords that would really suck if somebody hacked us and dumped that database. So. Uh, anything else? Okay, thank you for coming. <laughs>